Hello and welcome to Science Fiction, Race, and Racism. This is a video blog and channel about the most famous and influential works in science fiction and how they deal with issues of race, ethnicity, racism, prejudice, and intolerance. Both the best and the worst, the most, the most groundbreaking and insightful, and the most callous and clueless. Science fiction has a long history of both being opposed to racism, prejudice, and intolerance, but also of conscious or unconscious racism. Sci-fi fans, authors, and works are often said to be above, beyond, incapable of, and far past any prejudice. That is often the appeal of sci-fi, especially the most utopian works. Sometimes a sci-fi setting, story, or theme can be another way to comment upon, critique, or tear apart prejudice and hatred. For others, sci-fi is pure escapism, a way to get away from such issues. Sometimes this backfires. The most escapist sci-fi work is often the most racist. Sometimes these approaches or beliefs coexist within a work of sci-fi, within an author or a sci-fi fan. My name is Al Carroll. I'm Associate Professor of History at Northern Virginia Community College. I teach American, American Indian, and Latin American history. I've written mostly about wars, veterans, human rights, and genocide. I've also written some science fiction, mostly alternate history, including a sci-fi alternate history book, The Man in Black, the first of a series. This first video is the first of five videos about the most popular and influential sci-fi series of all time. In over 50 years, there have been eight Star Trek television series, 13 films, plus novels, comics, magazines, games, theme parks, exhibits, fan conventions, fan-made films and series, fan fiction, and huge numbers of fan sites. A big part of his popularity is his optimism a big part of its popularity is its optimism, idealism, even utopian vision. Its point of view, infinite diversity and infinite combinations, is a central part of why it caught on and remains influential. The first series began in the middle of the civil rights and anti-war movements. It had a multiracial cast in a time when that was still very unusual. It had in Spock a mixed race character presented as mixed species and mixed race relationships at a time in which it was actually illegal in much of America and the world. But for all of its powerful symbolism and arguments for a future where racism and prejudice were problems of the distant past, the series and films often showed themselves to still be very powerfully influenced by the racist assumptions of the time in which it was made. Start with something very obvious. Most of the original cast and crew were whites, European ancestry. Out of eight regular characters, six of them were white, five of them white males. These proportions are roughly similar for the rest of the crew and rest of Starfleet depicted. In the future, are European ancestry people three-fourths of, of the Earth's population? This has never been true at any time in human history, not even when some Europeans and their descendants killed over 75 million natives with multiple genocides, seven genocides just within the U.S. alone all the way to forced sterilization and forced adoption, continuing all the way to the 1970s, at the time that Star Trek was still being made. Surely, Star Trek writers were not arguing whites, who make up only one out of six of all humans, make up three-fourths of all humans in space in the future. This would imply either mass deaths for Africans, Asians, and others in wars and plagues, or that in the future, humans outside of North America and Europe have low technology, or either never desired or were not allowed space travel. Obviously, Gene Roddenberry and his writers were constrained by what American network TV would allow at the time. Compare the original Star Trek cast to other series at the time, almost all of them all white, and the original Star Trek looks downright radical. A cast that was mostly Asian, African, Latino, and Arab came much closer in later series and films, though it took another two series to have as a main character a captain who wasn't white. How did Star Trek depict American Indians? How did it show them the future? Let's start with defining who is native. American Indian, or Native American, is anyone descended from an indigenous original people of the Americas plus part of a native culture. For natives to see you as native, you must have descent plus culture. In Latin America also, even though most Latin Americans have native descent, Again, descent alone is not enough. If you quit identifying as Indio or Indígena, you no longer are. There are at least 60 million natives in the Americas, 
and six million in the U.S., mostly in major cities and recently in the U.S. Congress, as shown here. The first Star Trek series had no native characters or actors, not even as guest stars or bit players. And the first Star Trek depiction of natives was embarrassingly racist and ignorant. Its main character was a German-American actress in dark makeup with an obvious fake wig. Here you see Sabrina Scharf as she looked without tan makeup with her natural brown hair and natural fair skin. The other white guest star playing Indian was Rudy Solari, an Italian-American actor playing native in obvious bad makeup and a ridiculous wig is a long Hollywood practice. Actually, few tribes wore headbands. These were just Hollywood's way to keep black horsehair wigs on white actors. The supposed natives in this episode are actually pretendians. This is a fake version of indigenous cultures similar to blackface. Playing Indian is an active impersonation, creating a false image designed to serve white Western needs, fantasies, and anxieties. The most common fake versions of natives include role-playing in the Boy Scouts and during Halloween, commercial products, the New Age movement, and over 2,000 racist sports mascots or names posing as native. There is a long history of whites playing deliberately false white racist caricatures of natives in Hollywood too. The same fake versions of natives also showed up in sci-fi. This started with pulp novels like Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers influenced by colonialism, imperialism, reactionary politics, stereotypes, and other beliefs in white supremacy. Before anyone claims that whites playing Indian was just the way it was done back then, that is not even close to true. Actually, Hollywood first hired native actors all the way back in the 1900s. And the first native film star was Winnebago actress Lillian St. Cyr, way back in 1909. The first native actor to become famous on TV was also very early way back in 1951, Seneca actor Jay Silverheels in The Lone Ranger. The reason why many whites like to play Indian or even teach their children it's okay and why many prefer to see whites playing Indian, both on film and off, is because of white guilt over genocide, conquest, and land theft. Replacing actual natives with white caricatures is a control issue. These caricatures will then act out stereotypes for white audiences and convince them such racist parody is harmless fun, even good or truthful. Such play acting erases any thought of genocide, the same way that whites in blackface erases reminders of slavery. Playing Indian images often center on the idea that natives were doomed primitives trapped in the past. In Star Trek's Paradise Syndrome, the fake versions of natives are said to be from three tribes kidnapped by aliens 1,600 years earlier, the Navajo, Mohegan, and Delaware. They are shown as having no change in technology or lifestyle in 1,600 years. In fact, in true history, in the past 1,600 years, the Navajo migrated from Alaska to the southwest. They were originally at the Paskin people, over time splitting and becoming the Apache and Navajo. They went from hunter-gatherers in the Arctic to agriculture in the Southwest, growing crops with extensive advanced irrigation. They also became herders, domesticated animals, learned silver and goldsmithing, and are famous for their artistry in weaving and pottery. None of that was true 1,600 years ago. Natives have always progressed in technology. Whites just are not taught about it or are taught the myth of primitivism in order to justify genocide and land theft. The tribe that Spock calls the Delaware are actually the Lani Lenape. Where they once lived became the state of Delaware, but that was not their name for themselves. Both the Mohegan and Lani Lenape, far from being trapped in one era, adapted technology very readily, especially iron, guns, and other items brought by Europeans. Where, where Spock describes them as peaceful, all three have warrior traditions. And the teepees in the episode? None of the three tribes used them. The plot of the Paradise Syndrome has an object left by aliens believed to be a gift from their gods. Kirk is given amnesia by that object. He then saves a native boy with CPR. 
The script then depicts natives as worshiping him as a god, rather than logically as just someone who has the basic skills of a medic. Supposed primitive natives worshiping whites is a common racist trope used by Europeans since the first invasion. There's little evidence that natives ever thought any white to be godlike. From the start, they could see Europeans were very human, breathing, eating, bleeding, and dying, and with every human vice, including brutality and greed. Even the silly claim that Aztecs thought Cortez was a god is nonsense. A few may have briefly considered the idea, but it's certainly not any stranger than white American evangelicals thinking Trump was sent by God. Historians know this story was spread by Spaniards after conquest to denigrate them. Obviously, Aztecs and other native nations fought Europeans from the start and for over 400 years, something you don't do if you believe they are gods. The next pretendian in Star Trek was Ensign Walking Bear, a Comanche member of Starfleet in the Star Trek animated episode, Sharper Than a Serpent's Tooth. James Duan, Scotty from the original series, portrayed him. Since this is animation, it's not really a problem, except for the fact that Duan, usually very good with accents, made no attempt to give him an accurate Comanche or Southwestern native accent. If you want to hear such accents, watch series like The Sun or Comanche Moon. The Mayan god Kulkulkan is shown as a powerful alien who taught Mayas calendars and how to build their cities. This is ancient aliens nonsense, originally spread by the deliberately false and very racist Chariots of the Gods book and film. The author, Eric Von Daniken, was a convicted serial con man with deeply racist beliefs on Africans and natives. He claimed, and then later on the equally racist Ancient Alien series claimed, that aliens built ancient African and native civilizations because anyone not white was obviously inferior and stupid, and this Star Trek episode repeats that claim. The episode's depiction of both Comanches and Mayas makes no sense. Mayas and Comanches are not related, not by language nor culture. They are almost 2,000 miles from each other. Comanches had a powerful empire on the plains built on raiding. Mayas had dozens of city-states, advanced agriculture, astronomy, advanced surgery, and a hierarchy ruled by priests. Comanche likely didn't split off from their ancestors the Shoshone until around the year 1500. Mayas go back over 4,000 years. The next time Star Trek depicted natives was in the Next Generation episode, Journey's End. It is far better, but still mixed. This time, all natives were played by actual native actors, especially their leader, played by Chidi Macha actor Ned Romero, best known for playing Chief Joseph. The plot has Pueblo tribal people who will be forcibly removed by Starfleet to hand their land over to the Cardassians. Picard also discovers his ancestor took part in atrocities. The idea of the past having a direct impact on the future and that we are responsible for it is something that many genocide deniers prefer to deny. But the episode argued it in line with native ethics and philosophy. The first half of this episode fits with indigenous futurism. Indigenous futurism is the rare science fiction or fantasy that speaks to and represents indigenous voices and serves indigenous needs. It is usually written by natives for natives, but outsiders can write or make it if they use great care and extensive, accurate knowledge. But the last half of the episode degenerates into both the white savior syndrome and nonsense taken from the New Age movement. Wesley Crusher, the most hated character in all of Star Trek, takes part in a vision quest. The problem is, the Pueblo don't have vision quests. Native vision quests also are not for outsiders. Whites taking part is fraudulent, offensive, and exploitation. Outsiders in the sweat lodge are usually being hustled by white imposters for profit. Such con men don't know how to do them safely, so outsiders are often injured, assaulted, or even die. In the story, this elder is then revealed to, uh, to Wesley to be an alien spouting goofy New Age nonsense that is supposed to be profound, the character of the Traveler. Having a white teen boy as the tribe's rescuer and a New Age message undercuts everything good about the episode. The most extensive depiction of natives in Star Trek is the character Chakotay in Voyager. 
One more time, Star Trek gave us a pretendian, a very inaccurate imposter only desi designed to serve white fantasies. Chakotay is, is a sidekick to a white lead character, and he is far more stereotypical than Tonto. At least Tonto is heroic, rescuing the Lone Ranger at times. Chakotay was the opposite, usually a bumbler or having to be rescued. Chakotay is also a patchwork of New Age fantasies and misconceptions. Star Trek writers and producers deliberately avoided making Chakotay a member of any tribe that actually existed anywhere outside of screenplay. They mixed and matched bits of, and pieces of New Age cliches about natives without any regard for accuracy or believability. His fictional Anurabi tribe is said to be from South American jungles, but they venerate sky people. Generally, the pantheons of jungle tribes involve forest creatures, not what they can't see through jungle canopy. Producers Berman, Pillar, and Taylor had Takote's made-up tribe using sweat lodges they falsely assumed are a universal ceremony of all native peoples. Chakotay even invited his commander, a white woman in her 40s, to take part in a vision quest, a ceremony meant only for natives and only for adolescent boys ages 12 to 14. Chakotay also urged Janeway to try and find her animal totem. Again, this is a New Age idea and not native at all. Chakotay also is not an elder or a medicine man, but an alienated member of his tribe, far from his fictional people. He would not have much knowledge of traditions nor would he be trusted with the details of ceremonies. His tribal tattoo is more of an amusing mistake. Television re viewers might recoil in horror at an authentic looking tribal tattoo, so the producer settled for a cute tattoo in one corner of his face that resembles an incomplete moko, not of any natives anywhere in the Americas, but of Pacific Island peoples like the Maoris of New Zealand. Star Trek writers even completely fabricated a non-existent ceremony, the Pakra, which is also not native, and it resembles ancestor worship as practiced in Asia, not anything native. As many errors as the writers for Voyagers made, it could have been worse. In the original script for the episode Tattoo, writer Larry Brody intended for Chakotay's people to be Mayas, and he gave them non-existent Mayan medicine wheels. Brody's script even claimed the Mayan culture later became the Anasazi, leaping over thousands of miles and enormous cultural differences without any actual research. All these errors would be comical, except that Voyager producers were openly preaching New Age beliefs, in sharp contrast to the usual militant atheist viewpoint of Star Trek. Even the most cursory web search shows an overwhelmingly derisive and negative fan reaction to their New Age evangelism. Robert Beltran was much criticized for passing. He identified as Mexican until criticized by natives when suddenly he claimed to be Maya. While he certainly has native ancestry, he has no ties to native cultures. Star Trek Voyager's writers and producers relied on a notorious New Age fraud, Jackie Marks, a.k.a. Jamaki Highwater, who had been exposed as an imposter for profit a decade before Star Trek relied on him. There are literally millions upon millions of better sources or consultants they could have used. Every single living native per person and most academics would have been far better. Instead, they relied solely on a debunked white New Age imposter pandering to white racist fantasies for profit, the literal worst source one could use outside of a Klansman. And for all their pretensions to have enlightened views of natives, Voyager fell back on old stereotypes they showed Chakotay's people as trapped in the past, or deliberately choosing to live in the past, even in the 24th century. Chakotay's choice to join Starfleet was scripted as a complete rejection of his native culture, rather than what it obviously was, adaptation. Even the actor portraying Chakotay, Robert Beltran, was strongly, was strongly critical of his own character and its writers, producers, and creators. Since then, no one else in Star Trek has written any further episodes nor anyone in any of the over a dozen films have any more than passing mention of native people, themes, subjects, or issues in any way. There was briefly a native female in the graduating class at Star Trek Academy, and there was another native officer among the Maquis. And that was it. Except for the first half of the Journey's End episode, Star Trek has yet to have any story or native characters that live up to the series' own ideals. This is the end of the second video. I look forward to your comments and questions. Please repost freely, like, share, and comment. 
Next video, we will discuss Star Trek and Africans. This has been Science Fiction, Race and Racism, video blog and channel.